We lived by the Kanye, and we died by the Kanye. A plot to target Robert Mueller spirals out of control, and polarization continues over the Pittsburgh anti-Semitic shooting. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. You know, it take a big man to forego saying, I told you so, when he tells somebody that something was going to happen, and then it happened. I am not that man. I'm going to tell you exactly when I was right. I was right about Kanye West because, of course, I mean, come on. I wasn't the only one saying this. We'll get to Kanye West. We'll also get to the funniest story of the day. And we'll get to uh, a lot of other material, including a weird segment on Dr. Phil that was, that was really strange. We'll get to all of that in just one second. First, let's talk about how you protect your eyes. You're using your screen more often than ever, right? You're, you're constantly on your phone. You're constantly on your laptop. You probably don't realize that the average American is blasting their eyes with bright screens for about 11 hours a day. And then when I think about myself, I'm thinking like only 11 hours? I'm awake for at least 16, so that means that 14 of the 16 hours I'm probably on a screen. Well, that's why you should be protecting your eyes with a pair of Felix Grey glasses that are available with or without a prescription. Felix Grey glasses, they're fantastic. I wear them when I'm not on the air. They filter out 90% of high energy blue light. They eliminate the glare coming off of all of those screens, so you don't have to worry about dry eyes or blurry vision or headaches. It seems like a hassle to protect your eyes, and you would have to wear those really ugly kind of goggle glasses, but that's where Felix Grey comes in, because Felix Grey glasses are aren't like the weird computer glasses you've seen before. There's no yellow lens, lens tint, and they are handcrafted from premium Italian acetate, so they're not going to make you look nerdy, which for me is a real accomplishment. Go check it out right now at felixgrayglasses.com slash Ben. Don't spend another day looking at screens and messing up your eyes without the Felix Gray Glasses. felixgrayglasses.com slash Ben to protect those eyes. That's felixgrayglasses.com slash Ben. Very classy, very classy looking, so go check them out. Right now, FelixGrayGlasses.com slash Ben. Okay, so I do want to get to Kanye, and I do want to get to uh, the Jacob Wool story. You've never heard of Jacob Wool? Well, you will by the end of today's show. I want to get to all of that, but I have to begin today with the full insanity on display from some members of the hardcore left. You know, th there's a lot of talk this week about radicalization and polarization. And the idea is that right-wing radicalization is being led by the right-wing rhetoric at Fox News and, and the right-wing rhetoric from President Trump. Expressing this viewpoint today is Paul Krugman, who is legitimately one of the worst columnists in America. He has heavy competition over on the New York Times editorial page with folks like Charles Blow. But Krugman is truly an execrable columnist. I usually reserve that word only for Michael Moles, but it certainly applies to Paul Krugman as well. Krugman has a column today called The Hate is on the Ballot Next Week. And here is what he says. He says, in America 2018, what aboutism is the last refuge of scoundrels and both sidesism is the last refuge of cowards? So his suggestion here for folks who don't know what these words mean, what aboutism is a, a kind of newfangled word for you don't want to pay attention to the stuff your own side is doing, so you blame the other side. So if you're talking about President Trump's sexual infidelity, then you say, oh yeah, well, what about Bill Clinton's sexual infidelity? That would be whataboutism. So he's saying that whataboutism is now taking place on the basis of rhetoric. He says, if you hadn't noticed, we're in the midst of a wave of hate crimes. Just in the past few days, bombs were mailed to a number of prominent Democrats plus CNN. Then a gunman massacred 11 people at a Pittsburgh synagogue. Meanwhile, another gunman killed two African-Americans at a Louisville supermarket after first trying to unsuccessfully break into a black church. If he had gotten there an hour earlier, we probably would have had another mass murder. All of these hate crimes seem clearly linked to the climate of paranoia and racism deliberately fostered by President Trump and his allies in Congress and the media. Killing black people is an old American tradition, but is it experiencing a revival in the Trump era? Okay, that sentence is purely despicable. The idea that killing black people is an old American tradition, but it is experiencing a revival. I assume what he means by that is that slavery and Jim Crow were old American traditions and that Trump is reviving those, which of course is a complete lie. He, co he continues, he says, when the bombs were discovered, Many on the right immediately claimed there were fake news or a false flag operation by liberals. But the FBI quickly tracked down the apparent source of the explosive devices, a fanatical Trump supporter, who many are already calling the MAGA bomber. Well, that would be all of the folks on the left who wish to attribute his actions directly to President Trump. The man arrested at the Tree of Life Synagogue, Paul Krugman writes, has been critical of Trump, who he apparently believes isn't anti-Semitic enough. But his rage seems to have been fueled by conspiracy theories being systematically spread by Trump supporters that claim that Jewish financiers are bringing brown people into America to displace whites. So here's when he gets to the point. He says, how are Trump apologists dealing with this ugly picture? Partly through denial, pretending not to see any link between hateful rhetoric and hate crimes, but also through attempts to spread the blame by claiming the Democrats are just as bad, if not worse. Trump supporters try to kill his critics 
while some Trump opponents have yelled at politicians in restaurants. Now, I know you're sitting there, you're yelling at your phone, you're yelling at your car radio, you're saying, but Paul Krugman, it's not just that Democrats have engaged in screaming at people at restaurants. The Volusia County headquarters of the Republican Party was shot up, right? People shot bullets through the windows a day ago. A Bernie Sanders supporter shot up a bunch of Congress people, including Steve Scalise, whom he nearly murdered. So what are you talking about? But that would be whataboutism, according to Paul Krugman. If you mention that, that is now whataboutism. He says, this whataboutism doesn't stop with equating protests with violence. It also relies on outright lying. And then he talks about Nancy Pelosi. He says, false equivalents portraying the parties as symmetric, even when they clearly aren't, has long been the norm among self-proclaimed centrists and some influential media figures. It's a stance that has hugely benefited the GOP, as it has increasingly become the party of right-wing extremists. You might have thought that the horrifying events of recent days would finally break the norm, but you would have been wrong. Both sidesism, it turns out, is a fanatical cult impervious to evidence. Trump famously boasted that his supporters would stick with him, even if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue. What he didn't point out was that pundits would piously attribute the shooting to incivility and that Sunday talk shows would feature Fifth Avenue shooting advocates and give them a respectful hearing. This needs to stop, and those who keep practicing both sides need to be shamed. At this point, pretending that both sides are equally to blame or attributing political violence to spreading hatred without identifying who's responsible for that spread is a form of deep cowardice. The fact is that one side of the political spectrum, says Paul Krugman, is peddling hatred while the other isn't. And refusing to point that out for fear of sounding partisan is, in effect, lending aid and comfort to the people poisoning our politics. Yes, hate is on the ballot next week. So it's the Democrats are completely innocent. The Republicans are completely blameworthy for every terrible thing that's been said, leading to a rash of hate crimes. And it's not just Paul Krugman saying this. It's also Don Lemon. So Don Lemon on CNN, a man who, who you recall defended Antifa. In recent weeks, he went on his show with Chris Cuomo. The, the worst segments on CNN are always Don Lemon with Chris Cuomo. They're, they're always just the worst. It, because, again, it, it looks like it's just two blocks of wood clonking each other. But here, here is Don Lemon talking about he doesn't see Democrats killing people over politics. I mean, that's just not something that's... Well, actually, let's do this one first. Don Lemon says, the biggest terror threat is white men. Listen to how he... Listen to his language here. He says, we have to stop demonizing people. We have to stop demonizing people, but white men are the devil. Here is Don Lemon saying the biggest terror threat is white men. So we have to stop demonizing people and realize the biggest terror threat in this country is white men, most of them radicalized right up to the right. And we have to start doing something about them. There is no travel ban on them. There is no ban on, you know, they have the Muslim ban. There is no white guy ban. So what do we do about that? So I've heard that inflammatory rhetoric only is present on the right. And I also don't know whether Don Lemon can even hear the words coming out of his own mouth. He says, we need to stop demonizing people. Also, white men need to be stopped. Okay, well, that's weird. And it, listen, statistically speaking, the majority of terror killings in the United States over the past year since 9-11 have been perpetrated by white men. That is true. And that is, an, that is an accurate statement. It is also accurate to say, just statistically speaking, that the disproportionate number of murders committed in the United States are committed by young black men. That doesn't mean that we ought to be targeting young black men or that we ought to be targeting white men. It means that we ought to be targeting criminals. But Don Lemon is fully fine with demonizing an entire segment of the population on the basis of a few fringe actors who commit acts of evil. And then Don Lemon goes even further. Right? He says, I don't see Democrats killing people over politics. Like, that's not a thing that's happening which is a weird thing to say a year after somebody shot up a congressional baseball game and nearly killed the House Majority Whip. But here's Don Lemon being an ignoramus. A right-wing group killed the woman in Charlottesville. This guy is a right-winger who killed the people in the synagogue. The, um, the right-winger sent um, bombs to CNN and to Democrats. I don't see Democrats killing people because of political... Yeah, there may be po uh, Democratic operatives who are out well, there saying... To. Okay, and then when that guy said they tried to, then both Max Boot and Don Lemon went nuts. How dare you say that? The rhetoric of the Democrats is not the same as the rhetoric of the Republicans. Okay, this is the routine that Democrats are pulling these days. Brian Stelter, he's a Sunday news host on CNN. He says, I hope that Fox personalities think about their role in jacking up the climate of violence. I sure hope some of those Fox hosts, some of those commentators, take a moment, take a minute to think about their role in this environment. Hopefully there's some soul searching right now in the wake of this massacre. Brian, do you have a fever right now? I mean, what are you thinking? 
What are you thinking? Mm -hmm. They like ratings. They like winning the ratings war. That's what this is about. And then there's Alison Camerata suggesting that Fox News hosts don't care if people die so long as they get their ratings. Steve Schmidt, former McCain campaign advisor in 2008, who's been making bank off of being the Republican who's not actually a Republican on MSNBC for years, he blames Mark Levin and Rush Limbaugh. He says they have blood on their hands. The propaganda industry that she commands with the vile president that she serves, abetted by Mark Levin and Rush Limbaugh and Breitbart and Newsbusters and Judicial Watch and all the rest of them, have blood on their hands for the incitements that they have made that have triggered and radicalized these crazy people. It is deliberate. In so we've intent. talked about radicalization, right? We've talked about radicalization and the left keeps saying it's, it's radicalization of rhetoric on the part of people on the right that has led to this increase in hate crimes. Again, statistically unverified as of yet because we don't have the FBI statistics for this year. They're only done a little bit later. But beyond that, this idea is that it's only the rhetoric of the right that is to blame. And if you mention the rhetoric of the left, then this is whataboutism. It is whataboutism. There are two ways to radicalize folks, and they're interrelated. One is inflammatory rhetoric. Rhetoric is connected with violence because it's connected with action. Now, that doesn't mean that rhetoric is always incitement to violence. That's an actual legal standard that nothing President Trump has said meets. But there's no question that rhetoric and violence or rhetoric and radicalism, these things are related. But there are two ways in which rhetoric can lead to radicalization. One is radical rhetoric leading to radicalization. The other is gaslighting. And I'm going to explain what I mean by this in just one second, because I know that there are people who are listening to this show right now, who are watching this show right now, and they are feeling more angry and more radical after having listened to Paul Krugman, after having listened to Steve Schmidt, after having listened to Don Lemon. I'll explain why that is and why the left is doing a deep disservice and contributing, contributing to a highly ratcheted up, polarized political environment, including inflammatory rhetoric, in just one second. First, let's talk about what you do for your stamps. So, look, you love the post office. It, it offers a lot of great services, but you don't actually want to go down to the post office and stand in line. Instead, you want to be able to sit at your desk and get all the great services of the post office, just like you're able to get products in any other way. Well, this is why you need to go over to stamps.com. With stamps.com, you can access all the amazing services of the post office directly from your desk, 24-7 when it is convenient for you. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package using your own computer and printer. The mail carrier picks it up. Just click, print, mail. You're done. It could not be easier. We use stamps.com here at the Daily Wire offices. I use stamps.com in my own home because it saves me time and it saves me money. Right now, use promo code Shapiro and get a special offer. 55 bucks of free postage, digital scale, and a four-week trial, which is pretty solid. Again, that digital scale allows you to get exact postage every time. And the deal includes up to 55 bucks of free postage, that digital scale, and the four-week trial. Go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the radio microphone at the top of the homepage and type in promo code Shapiro. That's stamps.com, promo code Shapiro for that special deal. Again, stamps.com, promo code Shapiro. So Steve Schmidt is a schmuck, okay? When he says that Mark Levin and Rush Limbaugh are to blame for an anti-Semite shooting up a synagogue, Mark Levin happens to be Jewish, by the way. And then Chris Hayes in that same clip comes back and says, oh, yeah, and all, there used to be all these Republicans who used to condemn bad rhetoric, like Mitt Romney and Ben Shapiro. It's like these people haven't listened for five minutes to my show in which I condemn bad rhetoric on all sides on a routine basis, like legitimately every day, every day. But you know, th there's a narrative that's being driven here by Don Lemon, a guy who defended Antifa, right? that th only one side of the aisle is responsible. And if you mention the other side of the aisle, this is because you're being dishonest. This is gaslighting. So a lot of President Trump's critics have in some cases rightly suggested that President Trump gaslights his opponents. Though what he does is he says something that is false. People say that it's false. He says, ah, I never said that. That's not what I said. What I said is something completely different. Who are you going to believe? You or your own lying eyes? Okay, the left is doing that right now. What the left is doing is engaging in inflammatory rhetoric. They are claiming that Republicans across the country are responsible for an anti-Semitic slaying at a synagogue, are responsible for a nut job, a whack job in Florida, sending pipe bombs to Democratic officials. And then they say, who, us? We're radicalizing people? No, how dare you? How dare you? We're just here calling it like we see it. We're just here being honest about the situation that we face. And at the same time saying, well, no, no, Democrats have never engaged in violence. Okay, it's not just the congressional baseball shooting, folks. Okay, within the past few years, we've seen riots in Ferguson, Missouri. We saw riots in Baltimore, Maryland. We saw riots in Charlotte, North Carolina. All of those riots were pushed for, were inspired 
were, were justified by a number of Democratic officials basically saying that the cause that was being rioted about was a just cause. When police officers, five police officers were shot to death in Dallas a couple of years ago, a few years ago, President Obama had said a lot of things against the police just before that. Obama wasn't responsible for the shooting. But if we're going to talk about a radical political environment that oftentimes is involved with raising the temperature so that violence breaks out, to ignore all of this is just ignorant. And not only ignorant, it's a deliberate attempt to drive you nuts. It's a deliberate attempt to raise the temperature. And, and that is unsustainable. It's unsustainable. And when, when Representative Maxine Waters is saying that President Trump should take responsibility for the bomb threats, the same Maxine Waters who called the L.A. riots an uprising and called for Republican public officials to be confronted in public places, when Julia Jaffe of GQ is blaming President Trump for his extreme rhetoric and then goes on CNN and says that Trump radicalizes more people than ISIS, when Vice President Joe Biden says that Americans should vote for politicians out of character, the same Joe Biden who said that Mitt Romney was going to re-enslave black folks in the United States, of course we feel like we're being gaslit. I have some more thoughts on this in just a second. Of course we feel like we're being gaslit because we are being gaslit. Okay, the Democrats have suggested that they are responsible for none of what has happened. President Trump is the beginning of time. With President Trump, the universe burst into being suddenly. The big bang of politics occurred and suddenly time began flowing forward. Before, there was no such thing as time. Then President Trump sprung on the scene and suddenly he was the creator, lord and master of all bad rhetoric in the United States. I will condemn President Trump when I believe that he has used inflammatory rhetoric. I will condemn other hosts when I think that they are using inflammatory rhetoric or exaggerating their case or making things up. I do it every single day on the program. But I'm not going to sit by and pretend that the left is not responsible for at least an equal amount of this sort of rhetoric. I'm not going to pretend that anti-Semitism among white supremacists is somehow a, a massively greater threat to Jews across the world and in the United States than the Democratic Party's full embrace of radical anti-Semites like Linda Sarsour. That's the mainstream Democratic Party doing that. This is, it's, it's a mark of both political immaturity and deep, and deep philosophical shallowness to refuse to look in the mirror. And Democrats right now are refusing to look in the mirror. There are Republicans who for years have been refusing to look in the mirror. I've been a big advocate of everybody ought to look in the mirror, and it's all of our responsibilities to take the temperature down. That's something we actually ought to be doing. But Democrats aren't interested in doing that. They're interested in raising the temperature. Does Paul Krugman think the temperature is raised or lowered when he suggests that Republicans are all a bunch of evil people who don't care whether folks get shot at a synagogue? Does Don Lemon think he's making the country more or less polarized, more or less radicalized, when he suggests that President Trump and Republicans are responsible for terror attacks. Do they think that they're making things better? Of course they don't think they're making things better. And if folks on CNN can accuse Fox News hosts of dialing for ratings, then CNN is doing exactly the same thing with its own base. I'm, I'm amused, amused by Democrats and, and CNN hosts who suggest, well, Republicans are engaged in conspiratorial thinking. We never engage in conspiratorial thinking. Really? I've been alive for the past 20 years. I'm old enough to remember when you suggested that Halliburton was behind the Iraq war, when you suggested that George W. Bush lied specifically to get American soldiers killed because Iraq was a war for oil. I'm old enough to remember when you suggested without any evidence whatsoever that Donald Trump actively coordinated with the Russian government to skew the results of this election. I've been here the whole time, and you have too. Bad rhetoric? has been a part of American politics for a very long time. It has ratcheted up in recent years. It did not start with President Trump. President Trump exacerbates it because President Trump has never lowered the temperature on anything in his life. But that does not mean that he is the only one who's engaged in this. The media have ramped this thing up to 11. I've been saying this for years. President Trump is at 11. The media are at 11. And then they're surprised when the temperature is, is overheated. You gaslight people, they get angry. They get radicalized. And you won't, I've never seen Republicans, conservatives, as angry as I saw them about a month ago during the Brett Kavanaugh saga. And that wasn't a result of deplorable Republicanism. That was a result of the Democrats engaging in extreme partisanship and extreme rhetoric. Failing to recognize what exactly is happening here, calling it whataboutism, when you suggest correctly that bad things are happening on all sides and that everybody is kind of acting like garbage right now, that is contributing to this environment. That is making things significantly worse. And I think folks on the left know this, but I think that there are some folks on the left who don't care because they are so ensconced in their partisan worldview 
that to even acknowledge that folks on their own side are engaged in bad behavior would be to lend credence to the other side. And when it comes to defeating Trump, everything is on the table up to and including lying about the other side and more importantly, lying about your own side. And the mark of a good person and the mark of a good political movement is the capacity to look at yourself, recognize where you're flawed and try to become better. All the people in your life that you know and that you like, when you make a critique of them, their first reaction and your first reaction too, their first reaction is, okay, maybe I should think about that. Maybe I should think about that, right? When, I, when I'm criticized, my first reaction generally is, maybe I did do something wrong. And sometimes I did do something wrong and I have to change. But nobody seems to want to do any sort of self-reflection because we're in the middle of bashing each other across the skull with bricks as hard as we can and then suggesting that we are innocent in this brick fight. That's not the way that any of this works. And well, in just a second, I want to talk about the latest from Pittsburgh President Trump visited Pittsburgh. What was the fallout from that? Plus, we're going to talk about white privilege. We're going to talk about the Kanye West story. There's a lot of stuff coming up. But first, let's talk about what you're going to do in case of there, there's an emergency. So there's some sort of natural disaster, emergency strike without warning. We're surprised when the power goes out. We're surprised when, the, when it turns out that the grocery store shelves are empty where you can't get to the grocery store. That's why you ought to be prepared right now. So you plan now so you don't have to worry about it later. And that's where My Patriot Supply comes in. If you don't have an emergency food supply, you ought to. And that's why you ought to trust my folks at My Patriot Supply. A two-week food kit gets you started. This week, it's on special for just 75 bucks when you go to my special website, preparewithben.com, or call 888-803-1413. That's preparewithben.com, or call 888-803-1413. The food kits include meals that last up to 25 years in storage. Order now. Be prepared so there are no surprises. Again, 888-803-1413 or preparewithben.com. That's preparewithben.com, 888-803-1413. Get prepared so you never have to worry about this again. Folks in the office have tried the food. They say that it tastes like home cooking. And again, it lasts up to 25 years in storage. Preparewithben.com, 888-803-1413 for that special deal. 75 bucks for a two-week food kit. Go check it out right now. Okay, so... As all of this breaks out, we could be having a moment of unity. We could. Instead, we won't. We could be having a moment when we all say something terrible just happened. What can we do to fight anti-Semitism? Instead, what we're going to do is use every individual evil incident as an excuse to bash each other and club each other. So President Trump goes and he visits Pittsburgh and protesters, of course, show up to protest President Trump. Now, this is not a bunch of people who happen to be, you know, philo-Semitic wonderful pro-Jewish people who are just angry at President Trump for his failure to sufficiently condemn the alt-right in 2015. It turns out that all of these protesters are radically left, generally anti-Israel protesters who are out there protesting President Trump. Shocker. But the media is going to cover this as though this is a referendum on President Trump's rhetoric when, in fact, it's just a bunch of people who don't like Trump and they're using this as an opportunity to club Trump. And they've been doing this for a while now. Media, the media malfeasance, on the Pits, even on Pittsburgh, has been truly astonishing. I mean, the, the, the story that I talked about a couple of days ago in which the media suggested that a Jewish, that Jewish leaders didn't want Trump to come to Pittsburgh. And then they quoted a group called Ben the Ark and refused to acknowledge that that was a group run by Alexander Soros, George Soros, his son, that stated mission is to stop Trump. That's media malfeasance. The media, I mean, another example of media malfeasance on the Pittsburgh issue. So the chief rabbi of Israel is Rabbi David Lau. So Rabbi Lau, there's a lot of controversy in Israel over whether the conservative and the reform movements in Israel ought to be accepted by the rabbinate. My personal opinion is no, because they're not halachic, right? They, they, don't, they don't work according to Jewish law. There's a good argument to be made whether or not there actually ought to be a rabbinate in Israel, whether there ought to be like an, an official religious rabbinate in Israel. But put that aside, that controversy has existed. In the aftermath of the shooting, there was a story that went out at the Washington Post and a bunch of other leftist outlets trying to suggest that David Lau refused to acknowledge that the shooting happened at a synagogue. They suggested that Rabbi Lau had said that the shooting did not happen at a synagogue. It happened at a place of significant Jewish character. That was a lie. If you go back and you read David Lau's comments in Hebrew, he calls it specifically a Beit Knesset, which is to say a place where people pray, right, which is a synagogue. And the media completely misreported it because they have an agenda, which is to even split the Jewish community between the Orthodox and the non-Orthodox in the middle of an anti-Semitic shooting. In any case, these protesters gather for Trump and watch the media coverage. It's pretty astonishing. 
That sadness, that, that absolute shock at what has happened has turned into anger with news of the president's visit. There are several hundred people here at this protest getting ready to march just as the president uh, is expected to uh, land in, in Pittsburgh and, and move around the city. There is a second protest in the neighborhood. Uh, president Donald Trump in this neighborhood tonight is definitely unwelcome. Okay, he's unwelcome in this neighborhood. And then you look at the video. And there are people wearing SEIU jackets and carrying ACLU handmade, and not not handmade, printed out placards. Okay, the, the idea that all of these people are just grassroots folks who are showing up with no agenda other than they're just very upset about President Trump and his, and his feelings about anti-Semitism. It's just nonsense. But that's not the way the media cover all of this. And then the media, of course, decided they were going to cover in great specificity a family of one of the synagogue shooting m- victims rejecting a Trump meeting saying that he was blaming the community. They neglect, of course, to mention that one of the people who was shot and survived was, in fact, a Trump voter, and that there were other Trump people who, you know, fans of Trump. Look, Trump's a polarizing guy. This is not any great shock. I mean, we've all known this for a while, but the media have decided to play this up, and the Democrats have decided to play this up, too, for political purposes. So President Trump wanted to do a unity rally in Pittsburgh. He wanted the mayor to come. He wanted Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to come. They all turned him down. They all turned him down. Why would they turn him down? Well, specifically for political purposes. And let's be real about this. This is not over outrage at associations with anti-Semites. If it were, they wouldn't be running Keith Ellison for the head of the DNC. This is specifically about they don't like Trump and this is a club they can wield against Trump. That's really cynical. Dividing Americans even further on the basis of this stuff is cynical. Now, with that said, does President Trump have an unfortunate tendency of putting his foot so far down his mouth that it goes through his colon, out his ass, and then back into his mouth again, creating an Ouroboros of stupidity? You bet he does. So President Trump tweeted this out after visiting Pittsburgh. I, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. He tweeted out, Melania and I were treated very nicely yesterday in Pittsburgh. The office of the president was shown great respect on a very sad and solemn day. We are treated so warmly. He means treated. Small protest was not seen by us, staged far away. The fake news stories were just the opposite. Disgraceful. Okay, so it is true, as I say, that the media have miscovered this story from beginning to end. It is also true that when you go and visit the site of a mass anti-Semitic shooting, the worst in American history, the key central part of the story is not how you were treated. That's not really the important part of the story. It's not. And it looks like grandstanding. So, Mr. President, please don't do that. Uh, I always say please don't do it. Just He's not going to listen, but... And this, of course, is not is not helping in any serious way. OK, well, meanwhile, there are a couple of other stories that, that we must comment on here. So as I said long ago, live by the Kanye, die by the Kanye. So Kanye West became beloved of the right for the last six, seven months after he started making noises about how he loves President Trump. And he was wearing a MAGA hat and he was saying that he was thinking freely, all of which is totally fine. But as I tweeted, as soon as he started doing this, live by the Kanye, die by the Kanye. Kanye West is not a stable figure. He is not somebody who decided to become a, an ideological conservative after reading the combined works of William F. Buckley and Russell Kirk. Kanye West is a guy who sort of says whatever is on his mind that day. Well, that resulted in a reversal on Twitter yesterday. He has not rejected President Trump or ripped into President Trump, but he started tweeting out about sort of his political leanings now. He said, I support creating jobs and opportunities for people who need them the most. I support prison reform. I support common sense gun laws that will make our world safer. And then he continued. He said, I support those who risk their lives to serve and protect us. And I support holding people who misuse their power accountable. I believe in love and compassion for people seeking asylum and parents who are fighting to protect their children from violence and war. Okay, all of this sounds like a stump speech. And then he gets to the point. He finally, he finally tweets out, I introduced Candace Owens. This would be Candace Owens, the, the black conservative who was associated with, with Kanye's move to the right. I introduced Candace to the person who made the logo and they didn't want their name on it, so she used mine. I never wanted any association with Blexit. I have nothing to do with it. So Blexit is a movement that, that Candace has been pushing and Charlie Kirk has been pushing to get black folks to leave the Democratic Party. And in announcing Blexit, Candace suggested that the logo for Blexit was designed by Kanye West. He obviously does not feel that way, and he's upset about it. And he tweeted out, my eyes are now wide open and now realize I've been used to spread messages I don't believe in. I am distancing myself from politics and completely focusing on being creative. So, ouch, and also ouch. So, that's not good. But when you bet on people who are not the most stable people in the world and you pretend that they are deeply stable, 
This is a not unpredictable consequence. I think it is fair to say that is not the least predictable consequence that has ever happened in human history. Fortunately, that was not the, the dumbest story of the day. The dumbest story of the day came courtesy of a guy named Jacob Wool. I'm going to explain this story to you in just a second because it is too wild and ridiculous for me to forego on this of all days. We'll discuss that in just a second. Now, this is the kind of story where to really enjoy it properly, you're going to want a drink in your hand. You're going to want a glass of wine, a beer, a spirit, some liquor. You're going to want some of that in your hand. Well, the way that you can get that in your hand without actually having to get up off of your couch while you're listening right now is Saucy. It's the alcohol delivery app. Saucy delivers your favorite wine, beer, and liquor right to your door on demand. Now, if you're in LA, the Bay Area, Chicago, San Diego, Sacramento, your Saucy order will arrive at your door in under 30 minutes ready to drink. For everybody else, Saucy can deliver beer, wine, and liquor to your door in two days or less nationwide. There are no order minimums, no delivery fees, no running to the store. If you've got the Saucy app, you've got a fully stocked bar directly on your phone, you're in the middle of a party, and you don't have time to get up and leave and go over to the liquor store, you just go on that Saucy app, and there it is, right at your door. For a limited time, you can get 15 bucks off when you download the Saucy app and enter promo code BEN. That's the Saucy app spelled S-A-U-C-E-Y. Enter promo code BEN for $15 off. Again, get that Saucy app today and use promo code BEN. It really is great for parties. I've had parties where... We've run out of liquor, not because of me. I'm not a heavy drinker, but others have been drinking and I need more alcohol. And then we grab the Saucy app and that liquor shows up right at our door just the way we ordered it. S-A-U-C-E-Y, enter promo code Ben for $15 off. Go check it out right now. Okay, I want to get into this Jacob Wool story. Also, Dr. Phil, we're going to get into that in just a second. But for all of those myriad glories, you're going to have to go over to dailywire.com and subscribe. For $9.99 a month, you can get a subscription to dailywire.com that comes up that comes along with all sorts of great benefits. The rest of my show live, the rest of Andrew Clavin's show live, the rest of Michael Knowles' terrible show live. You also get access to the Sunday special. We have an amazing Sunday special coming up this week. Tucker Carlson is stopping by. Here's what it sounds like. Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. I'm in Los Angeles and somehow wound up in Ben Shapiro's studio. We had this kind of unbelievable conversation for an hour, which I <laughs> went places I did not expect to go. And I just loved it. And I hope you like it. It's on his Sunday special. Now, Tucker's a kick, and you're really going to enjoy that Sunday special. It's, it's really, it's fun, and I think deep and interesting and quirky. It's, it's, it's one of the better Sunday specials we've ever done, for sure. So you're going to want to go check that out. When you get the $99 package, which is our annual subscription, then you get all of those things. You get to be part of our mailbag, get to all those things. And you get the Leftist Tears Hot or Cold Tumblr. Look at it. Feast your eyes upon it. It's in invisibility mode because we are abroad. Uh, when, once you go to Canada, things just start disappearing. It's very weird. But you can go check that out. Also, when you get all of those things, you also get access to the Daily Wire Backstage. Coming up, election night, Tuesday, November 6th. Don't miss our election night, Daily Wire Backstage. God King Jeremy Boring, me, Andrew Clavin, Michael Moles for some odd reason, Alicia Krauss, and Colton Haas, actually, is going to be stopping by. We'll be covering all the latest election news as it happens, so be sure to tune in. As always, only Daily Wire subscribers get to ask the questions because we will pry those dollars from you at any cost. So make sure to subscribe today. Go over to dailywire.com and do that. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast in the nation. So how crazy are our politics? Well, Kanye West was the second craziest story of the day. The first craziest story of the day yesterday was this crazy story about folks who are trying to sink Robert Mueller. They're very upset with Robert Mueller and they believe that Robert Mueller is somehow deeply compromised. How's he compromised? Well, He's compromised because he's investigating Trump, and therefore there was a scheme to find women and pay them to lie about being sexually assaulted by Robert Mueller. I kid you not. According to the Daily Beast, the scheme became public on Tuesday when Robert Mueller's staff formally asked the FBI to launch an investigation into the matter. But for weeks, it has been simmering below the surface with numerous reporters having been tipped off by a woman who claimed she had been approached with promises of cash. At the center of the scheme is publicity-hungry Republican lobbyist Jack Berkman, who's repeatedly dabbled in internet conspiracy theories in the past, including promoting the idea that murdered DNC staffer Seth Rich was killed by deep state government operatives. Berkman denied involvement in any attempt to pay people to frame or accuse Mueller, but he also claims he has witnesses who are going to expose the special counsel as a sexual harasser. He scheduled a Thursday press conference at a Holiday Inn in Northern Virginia to introduce his first accuser. Number one, if you ever are, are attempting to launch in credible fashion some sort of accusation, you should upgrade from the Holiday Inn. Just a recommendation. It's like, here we are in the parking lot of Motel 6. The light's always left on for you. I mean, good luck with this. That's not the part. That, so Bergman says that we're going to prove that Robert Mueller is a drunk and a sexual abuser. Yeah, sure you are. 
But that's not the part that's the best. So the best part is that Berkman apparently hired, I, I, he hired a, an intel agency, an intel agency that was, that was supposed to investigate Robert Mueller. In his efforts to dig up dirt on Mueller, Berkman appears to have enlisted outside help. Jacob Wool is a right-wing Twitter personality who's tweeted inane things for years about MAGA MAGA President Trump. He's a self-described friend of Berkman. He said Berkman had told him he had hired Matthew Cohen, who claims to be a managing partner at the private investigations company Surefire Intelligence, to assist with the investigation. Only one problem. Who is Matthew Cohen? Who is Matthew Cohen? Matthew Cohen, as it turns out, is Jacob Wool. Okay, and Jacob Wool apparently set up a bunch of fake LinkedIn accounts for people who worked for Surefire Intelligence by grabbing all these just random pictures from the internet and using them as employee pictures for his fake business. So, for example, he, he said that the, an investigator was named Donald Treehorn. Okay, that is a stock photograph of an actor. Again, he just used that. And then, that wasn't the, the and then, the Tel Aviv station chief, he called Talia Yaniv. Only one problem. That's a picture of Bar Raffaele, the, the Israeli supermodel. So he, he, he went through all this trouble. I feel bad for him a little bit. He went through all this trouble to create a fake business to hide what he was doing from the government. And then he went and got pictures of actors and used them as his fake employees. The financial investigator at Surefire Intelligence is supposedly a guy named Simon Frick. Who is Simon Frick? It's a picture of Christoph Waltz. It's a pretty solid hire there. <laughs> he somehow got the guy from Inglorious Bastards to be the financial investigator at Surefire Intelligence. Pretty, in, I mean, Christoph Waltz in, in Inglorious Bastards does have a good record of tracking people down. But, I mean, my goodness. Apparently, the deputy director of operations for Surefire Intelligence is Dr. Mike Harding of the First Baptist Church of Troy, Michigan. So, well done. This is the best part of this is that Wool was asked about all of this. And he denied all of it. And then it turns out that he registered the website under the name, uh, under the phone number of his mother. This is what the Daily Beast is saying. So suffice it to say, our politics is too crazy. People have been driven out of their minds. Surefire's website domain data lists an email address bearing Wool's name and that of a legally suspect financial firm he held, Next Management. Surefire's website also contains images uploaded to the same Google Cloud account, Wool, who hinted at the Mueller investigations on Monday night, denied any involvement in or knowledge of Surefire. He said he works for an influence marketing company in L.A. Yeah, turns out that um, not so much. So, yes, things are crazy out there and everybody needs to calm down. Now, that did not end the crazy yesterday. There was a lot of crazy yesterday. My favorite bit of crazy, actually, was not even that. It came courtesy of Joe Donnelly. This was late-breaking crazy last night. So Joe Donnelly is the Democratic Senate candidate in Indiana, he's the current senator in Indiana, and he was in a debate, and he started trying to describe his staff. Um, it didn't go well. Here's what Joe Donnelly had to say. Our state director is Indian American, but he does an amazing job. Our director of all constituent services, she's African American, but she does an even more incredible job than you could ever imagine. But? Hey, I wasn't aware that, that, that that's it. <laughs> it finally hit Colton back here exactly what that means. She's an Indian American, but she does an incredible job. You know, like unlike the other Indian Americans, my, my state director of grassroots operations is black, but she does an incredible job. Now, imagine that we're a Republican. Would that headline ever stop? No, the headline would never stop ever, 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 ever. But that's the way that this works now is that Democrats can say the most absurd on their face, stupid, ridiculous things and get away with it. But you have to enjoy. I mean, that is a full on Michael Scott fail right there. That is the office style Michael Scott failure. So well done. Well done, Democrats. Just amazing stuff. OK, so in just a second, I want to talk to you about a segment on Dr. Phil that really suggests one of the big problems in the country right now. So I don't know much about Dr. Phil. I don't watch a lot of daytime TV. I know a lot of people love Dr. Phil. He did a segment in which he had on Michael Eric Dyson and a bunch of other sort of social activists, particularly in the black community. And he did what he called a study. What was the study? Well, he got a bunch of people of different races and sexes and sexual orientations to line up, a bunch of young people in a line. And then he had somebody ask them some 30 questions about privilege in their life. And then he had you take a step forward for everything that you, every privilege you had and take a step back for every privilege you didn't have. So it was stuff like 
if both your if one of your parents works nights to support the family, take a step back. If you've ever been sexually harassed, take a step back. And by the end of that little exercise, some of the some of the young people were, you know, pretty far forward on the stage and some of the young people were pretty far backward on the stage. And here's how some of those young people responded to learning about their privilege. Thank you all for participating today. I'm very aware of my white privilege, but it really showed through when I looked behind me and most of the people in the very back were people of color. I was in the back. I'm not ever in the back of anything that I do. Being in the front made me feel uncomfortable. It's an awkward feeling to like be up there and know that like everyone behind you can look at you, right, but you can't look at them. I landed in the very back of the crowd. I was a bit surprised. I didn't have very much growing up, but I've always thought that there are other people who had less. I didn't know I was gonna end up in the front. The way I was raised by the border in Mexico, that I would be less privileged, though it's weird to know that I am actually doing good. I think talking about white privilege in a room full of white people is awkward, but in a room full of different ethnic groups, I think it's necessary. It's a very sensitive topic. You don't want to offend anyone, but it's true. There are racial okay. and social how is any of this useful? So here's the question. Dr. Phil says, ah, this, is, this was really interesting. And really, it was, it was real as something. I'm glad we did. Well, Dr. Phil, it's not. It's actually a bad thing. The reason it's a bad thing is you can listen to what some of these young people are saying. So there's a woman who is standing in the back, and she appears to be of maybe Filipino extraction. And she says, you know, it never occurred to me that I had it rough, right? It always occurred to me that there were people who were worse off than I was. Why is that a bad attitude? That's a really good attitude. And being awakened to the fact that you have it really rough and being thought of, thinking of yourself as a victim is a really easy path to slide into resentment and anger and rage at other people who, quote unquote, have it better. You know, there, there's a, a young black woman there who says, you know, I've never stood in the back in my life. That's the right attitude. The right attitude is you don't have to stand in the back just because of dint of birth or problems that you had growing up, in America, you can get ahead. But the entire privilege discussion is supposed to not awaken people to the fact that there's inequality in the United States in terms of where we start. We all know that. You have to be an idiot not to know that. But it's supposed to instead instill in people who, ha who were better off growing up that they somehow had an unfair advantage over others and to instill in people who are worse off growing up that the people in the front screwed them. Right, to even set it up in this sort of physical dichotomy where the people who are quote unquote more privileged are ahead and the people who are less privileged are behind is to suggest a sort of back of the bus mentality. Oh, you've been treated by America wrongly. Somebody has victimized you in some way. Well, virtually none, like, I, I, none of the questions that were asked in that segment were about members of the group victimizing each other. It was never, if you've been victimized by somebody in this group, take a step back. If you've victimized somebody in this group, take a step forward. None of those questions were about that. If it were about that, then we could talk about whether inequality and inequity are linked. But it wasn't about that. It was about, have you had it rougher or have you had it better? Why do you need full discussions of who's had it? There, there's no more boring discussion in the world than who's had it rougher or, or who's had it better. And I don't just mean boring in terms of like actually not interesting. I mean that it is useless and counterproductive. And there's a, a famous joke that says, there's nobody more boring than a person who you ask them how they are and they actually tell you. Okay, the same thing is true when it comes to this sort of stuff. Because in a country that is free, where you started is not where you end up. And re-inculcating the idea that where you started is where you end up is a way of ensuring that people don't do all that they can in order to better themselves. Thinking of yourself as a victim is the first path toward irrelevance and toward destroying your own life. It's really, really dumb stuff. It's really dumb stuff. Well, in just a second, I want to talk about specifically, you know, all of all of the kind of attempts to, to paint Americans as victims. There's a study out today. Here, here's an example. There's a study out today uh, that, that is from USA Today. And what it says that 62% of jobs don't support middle class life after accounting for the cost of living. Well, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? It sounds like 62% of Americans are basically on the verge of poverty. Well, that's not what the study says. So here's what the study says. Despite an unemployment rate that has reached a 50-year low of 3.7%, most jobs across the United States don't support a middle-class or better lifestyle, leaving many Americans struggling, according to a new study. 62% of jobs fall short of that middle-class standard when factoring in both wages and the cost of living in the metro area where the job is located, according to a study by Third Way, a think tank that advocates center-left ideas. Shocker. Now, here's the problem. Okay, it says, 
a slight majority of Americans, 52%, do live in middle-class households, according to a recent annual report by the Pew Research Center. Another 20% or so live in upper-income households. In other words, 72% of Americans are middle-income or better, are middle-class or better. So how does that square with 62% of middle-class jobs don't actually lead to middle-class lifestyles? It says that's because they're juggling multiple jobs or relying on investments and inheritance or other household members who may have higher-paying jobs. Right. So what? Most households in the United States have two people working. Most households in the United States have a person who may be working a couple of jobs. My entire life growing up, both my parents worked. My dad was home more than my mom. And my dad worked multiple jobs at a time when, when he was young with my mom. Like, this is, it's, it's, it's so foolish to suggest that people are starving in New York City while earning $50,000 a year. If you really believe that you're starving living in New York City, maybe the solution to that is to get rid of rent control, thereby lowering the rents, not to start saying that capitalism is responsible for all of these failures. It's just, the, the twisting of statistics is pretty astonishing. It, it, it says the rankings highlight some vivid contrast. A factory machinist in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, earns an average of $46,000 a year, more than enough to meet the $40,000 threshold for a middle-class job in the area. A similar machinist makes more, fifty-seven dollars in San Francisco, but that's far short of the eighty-two dollars minimum for a middle-class job in that area, according to the report. Why do you think that is? That's because San Francisco is governed like a liberal area with heavy rent control. So the problem here is not lack of jobs or lack of opportunity. The problem is that there are a bunch of regulations that make life more expensive in leftist areas. And maybe if you're a machinist, you're better off living in Idaho or Iowa. Maybe you're better off moving to Cedar Rapids than living in San Francisco. Is that a possibility? But we can never contemplate that possibility. Everybody's entitled to a job wherever they want and also entitled to a rent control department that raises rents for everybody else. So just genius stuff. Now, speaking of fun with statistics, I do want to point one thing out because I've seen this a little bit uh, maybe, maybe I'll say this for things I hate. So we'll, we'll do a quick thing I like, and then we'll do a quick thing that I hate. So things that I like. So this week, because I uh, did a, a some, some Jewish music yesterday, I decided that the rest of the week I'm going to pick some of my favorite nigunim. And nigunim are, are kind of Jewish tunes. Uh, this one was actually written and performed by a friend of mine from back in high school. Uh, and uh, And it's quite good. Uh, it, it, what's, what's fun about this, actually, so his name is Eitan Katz. Eitan Katz was uh, in my high school class. And if you go back to one of his very first albums, you can actually hear me playing violin in the background on the album. He just needed a violinist for like a cut or two. And so I came in and played the violin in the background a little bit. Here is uh, Eitan singing. Uh, this, is, this, this phrase is Lamancha uh, Elokim uh, Kai. It's, it's all about, um, obviously, uh, I want to find the exact translation. It says, act for your sake, our God, and not from ours. Behold our spiritual position, destitute and empty-handed. The soul is yours. The body is your handiwork. Take pity on your labor. This is something the Jews say on Yom Kippur night uh, in, in Slicho, which are sort of these special prayers that we say during this period. So um, this is, so here is, uh, here's Eitan singing it. <laughs>
It's, it's really nice stuff. Eitan's a really talented guy. I got the words wrong at the very beginning. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Lamancha lo kenu asev lo lanu re'ei imraseinu v'dalim v'rekim hanasham alach v'aguv palach chusa al amalach. So, uh, for, for those who speak Hebrew, I want to make sure. I get, every time I screw up the Hebrew, believe it or not, there are people who actually email me and they say you screwed it up. So, a couple of days ago, I got a bunch of emails from Orthodox Jews saying I'd screwed it up. So, I try to correct myself when I do. Okay, so... That's the thing I like for today. Yeah, spirituality, it's kind of a nice thing from time to time. Okay, time for a quick thing that I hate. So there's a statistic that's been cited uh, routinely by the mainstream media suggesting that Jews are no longer safe in the United States, and they cite a study put out by the Anti-Defamation League, which suggests that there has been a 57% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in 2017. That figure was reported in NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and a bunch of other media outlets. That is not what the study shows. That is not true. Okay, so there's a full breakdown of this over at Tablet. Basically, the study does not claim to actually count anti-Semitic incidents, but rather the reporting of the incidents, which is not the same thing. When the FBI reports it, what hate crimes are, it reports ones that they've investigated, not just reports of hate crimes. So this, this ADL study counts incidents that have been reported to the ADL by the media, law enforcement, and the public, and the ADL openly acknowledges that some of the increase in documented incidents is not an actual increase, but results from more people reporting incidents to the ADL than ever before. Also, the report doesn't just count certifiable anti-Semitic incidents, but any incident that results in Jews perceiving themselves as being victimized due to their Jewish identity. So that methodological tick includes 163 bomb threats made to the JCC, even though, the two, even though that perpetrator was not motivated by anti-Semitism. Right. 2017 saw an elevated kind of response from the Jewish community to perceive threat, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the number of actual violent incidents on record has increased. In fact, the ADL study shows a 47% decrease in physical assaults against Jews in the United States from 37 to 19. So it shows a 57% increase in incidents overall, but a 47% decrease in physical assaults in 2017, which is not consistent with all of the other data. So this is you know, let's get the data right. Do I think that there's increased anti-Semitism? I'm seeing increased anti-Semitism on my Twitter feed and in my own life. But do I think that that is necessarily statistically representative? No. And even if it is, we're going to need better data than the ones that are being cited by the media and all this. Okay, we have time for a quick Federalist paper here. So every week we go through a Federalist paper. We're all the way up to Federalist 49. This one's by James Madison. In this one, Madison argues specifically with Thomas Jefferson. So Jefferson had proposed that the new constitution allowed that whenever two of the three branches of government concur, a convention could be called for altering the constitution. So the judiciary and the executive don't like what the legislature is doing, so they call for a new constitutional convention. And Jefferson was much more of a, a Democrat than a Republican, not in the modern sense, but in the idea that he liked direct popular control a lot more than some of the other founders. He also liked the idea of constitutional revision on a fairly consistent basis. He argued that Madison says that if you are continually revising the Constitution, that undermines its appeal. It undermines the durability of the system. He writes, a nation of philosophers is as little to be expected as the philosophical race of kings wished for by Plato. In every other nation, the most rational government will not find it a superfluous advantage to have the prejudices of the community on its side. The danger of disturbing the public tranquility by interesting too strongly the public passions is still a more serious objection against a frequent reference of constitutional questions to the decision of the whole society. So basically, for all those people who claim that America's a democracy, it's not. It's a republic. One of the reasons is because the founders were deeply fearful of public passions resulting in bad policy and high rates of turnover in the consistency of that policy. Madison also argued that the procedure wouldn't actually curb the government because the legislature is more populous than the other two branches. So that means they'd probably win any convention fight. But once again, this cuts to the heart of how American government runs. It was not designed to be a system that quote unquote gets things done. It was designed to be a system replete with gridlock specifically so that the, the more unbridled passions of the public were not the most easily recognized, easily recognized and put into law by our system. Right? The idea is that if we really want to get something done, we can, but we really had better want to get something done. And even then, it can't violate those fundamental rights enshrined in the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Okay, well, we will be back here tomorrow with all the latest. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. 
The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Senya Villarreal. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Ingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caramina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire Ford Publishing production. Copyright Ford Publishing 2018.